Welcome to the American Society of Quality Lean Enterprise Division 2015 webinar series. By listening to our webinar series, you will get the best of the best in the lean industry. Stay tuned to the end of this recording for more details. This month, our speaker is Gwendolyn Galsworth, president and founder of Visual Thinking Incorporated and the Visual Lean Institute. With over 30 years of implementation, Gwen has published eight books, two of which have received the Shingle Prize and Professional Publication Award, which makes her the leading expert in workplace visuality. Now let's join Gwen as she presents Workplace Visuality, Perfect Partner to Lean. Thank you very much, Paul. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm really thrilled to be here, and I'm thrilled to be able to reach a national and perhaps even an international audience with uh, what is a basic primer in visuality set within a framework of partnering with Lean. So I hope you find this instructive. And I will say from the very beginning that this is a large topic, and with Paul's help, I have been able to kind of focus it on what we both believe will be of interest to uh, to this audience as an introduction. This and Paul, do I announce this polling question? Do, shall I read it or if you would read just, it? If you would read it, that would be great. And then uh, the poll question will actually come great. on for everybody. All right, thanks. Which phrase phrase best describes your company's current visual workplace approach? We develop visual devices as part of our lean journey, so we can see what is normal and abnormal. Visual devices happen spontaneously as we apply and conduct our Kaizen blitzes or our rapid improvement events. Sorry, that should be RIE. <laughs> and we pursue the visual workplaces as number three as a separate but equal partner to lean, or number four, none of the above, something else. And we'll give we'll give everybody just uh, about another few seconds here, Gwen. So okay. uh, again, really appreciate you being on here. I'm excited to hear some of your new stuff. <laughs> My pleasure, of course. Okay, looks like we have 37% for question number one. We develop visual devices. 17% yeah. Seven, visual devices happen spontaneously. 12% we pursue visual as a separate but equal partner to lean. 35% none or something else. Ah, that's so interesting. I'd be so interested to know what that something else is. Thank you very much for those numbers. Um, very pleased to see the 12% for uh, response three. We pursue the visual workplace as a separate but equal partner to lean. This, of course, is my orientation and what we're going to be doing today. Here's our agenda. What is lean? We're going to just talk about that for a moment. What is the visual workplace? I'll give you some basic terms. How visuality does it? What is the primer on the mechanism that makes visuality go? We'll look at some visual workplace results. I just selected some of them. And we'll then look at this alliance between visual and lean and give you a kind of image about how that works as I see it. So what is lean? Well, there are dozens of definitions of lean, as you know. And I picked out the one that I know best. My sensei was Shigeo Shingo in the 1980s. And I, <laughs> I have been. Um, pretty much brought up on this idea. It's very close. It has ancestry to JIT. And that is that lean is an improvement strategy focused on defining and streamlining the critical path through the relentless pursuit and elimination of waste throughout the enterprise. So in this definition, and I want to surface this because this will come up later on, the macro metric that we're looking at is time and its corollary speed. I have much to say about what has happened to lean since this definition was used in the 1980s and 90s, but I have been brought up on this definition and it works for me. And it will allow me to make a distinction between lean and visual that will be pretty clean and I hope useful to you in terms of understanding the difference between the two methodologies and also the difference in the kinds of results you can expect, <clears throat> what they do for the organization. So what is a visual workplace? Well, first, most of us think about a visual workplace 
as a series of point solutions, scheduling, um, some kind of status, normal, abnormal, shadow boards, and on Kanban, useful, relevant, clever, sort of like a hammer is useful and relevant and even clever, especially if you have a nail and two pieces of wood. But I want to ask you to recast your thinking, to think about workplace visuality or the visual workplace, which I use synonymously. I do not use visual management because that is a category, a subcategory of the visual workplace, which maybe we can talk about at another time. But in recasting your thinking about the larger paradigm, the umbrella, think about visuality, please, at least for our presentation, not as point solutions and not even as a tool, but rather as a system. And in fact, go a little bit further, please, and think of it as a system of system, of systems, a system of systems such as, here are some of the systems that you'll have, quality systems, supply chain, assembly system, material handling, purchasing, maintenance, leadership, in-house training systems. These are all systems. Visuality is the system that holds that. Visuality is the system that is actually the very ground in which these systems reside. That is its purpose and that is its benefit. And of course I will develop this as we continue to move through this. There is a reason why visuality is so fundamental, so foundational and it has to do with brain function. It has to do with this data point. 50% of our brain function is dedicated to finding and interpreting visual data. We are visual beings. Therefore, we live in a visual world. This is the way that we absorb and understand our world by using our senses with great dominance on the visual sense. Let me build this theme a little bit. We're visual beings, therefore we live in a visual world and not the reverse. The world hasn't taught us to be visual. We need it that way and that's why we have it that way. We send and receive messages not with only our eyes but through all of our senses, through our ears, through our sense of smell and as a result our behavior changes. When we smell the sulfur that was put intentionally in odorless, invisible, natural gas, our behavior changes. And that is the purpose of visuality, that it creates a behavior change. Visual messages are everywhere. We find them in the community, on our roads and highways, and our behavior changes as a result. All of these are devices that have been designed in in order to create safe, timely behavior and so we can get where we want to go on time and safely. The Probably the best system that I can refer you to are the roads and highways because such a variety of human beings use it on many, many different uh, skill levels and also there's a high risk. So there's a direct corollary here to your, uh, your facility, your business. Why not also at work? Because without a visually based environment, we are quite literally lost. We have no navigational anchor and that puts us in a state of risk. If the way that we navigate through our daily, our daily life, our experience is by using our senses, then what happens when we don't have any reference points? Well, it can be dangerous, it can be complicated, it can be very costly without visuality. So I want to set this as a basic ground, this understanding that human-based environments are flooded with visual devices because we need them. Why not the workplace? Why not the workplace? And this is actually the name of a factory that I once passed by. Luckily, I noticed it and I took the photograph and I'm now sharing it with you. And it had a, on the side here a tiny little window blind because they made blinds in this factory. But it is a perfect representation, a perfect image of what many, many factories, many 
many workplaces, hospitals, and certainly offices look like and how they function. Why not also the workplace, flooded with visual devices that are sharing information, vital information to the task at hand with us because we have made it so, because we have designed it, because we are visual beings and we have learned to become visual thinkers. So how does visuality do it? Here's the definition of a visual workplace. I developed this definition in the 1980s and it has been a, an anchor to my entire work since then. A visual work environment in, is one that is self-ordering. And because it is self-explaining, it is self-regulating. And on higher levels, we have a built-in self-improving loop, a built-in PDCA loop, where the workplace is continually talking to us, feeding back the impact of our behavior on our behavior. That's the first part of the definition. The second part is, because of the first, it is an environment where what is supposed to happen does happen on time, every time, day or night, because of visual devices. It is these devices that hold our intelligence, holds information, it holds the operational details of our operational system. I want to say again, whether hospital, office or manufacturing, or open pit mine. We did work with Luminant down in Texas. It was a complete open pit mine. It was dirt. You try to bring 5S to dirt, you're challenged. But in this environment, it's the visual devices that hold our intelligence while we are working. If we take these devices away, the description erodes. We can't hold on to it. There's no sustainability. And we have learned, in fact, that the way to create sustainability is through visuality. Let's define a visual device since they're so very important. They're central to the paradigm. A visual device is a mechanism, it is a thing that is intentionally designed to influence, direct, or even limit behavior. There's that word behavior again. How? By making vital information available as close to the point of use as possible to anyone and everyone who needs it without speaking a word. Visual devices, here they are. Here they are. Simple devices in the community, at work, holding our brain, holding our intelligent, our intelligence ready to help us whenever we need it, we pull the information to us because we put it there. Look at the gas, pump, uh, the gas pump today. Very complex, a lot of information, but look at it when it started in the 1920s. Just a simple bucket on top of a pole, gravity fed, with a little bit of etched calibration in this now glass bucket, so that whoever is pouring the gas into your little car will be able to gauge how much you owe them. But the transaction has remained the same. You give me the gas, I give you the money. It's as simple as that. And as the technology evolved, so the information sharing evolved. Until today, we have a lot of information sharing, vital information for a number of users, but the transaction is still the same and it happens without supervision. When we look at the car, for example, we see on the outside just a smooth, smooth beautiful vehicle. But when we look more closely, as our team did here at Visual Thinking Inc. about 10 years ago, we counted 144 visual devices that help us run the car as operators, maintain it as operators, and special people, our maintenance crew, that fancy repair joint down the street, they can do their fancy repairs also because visuality is helping them. Both the gas station and the car are examples of visual machines. Mm -hmm. So we have this deeply embedded into our everyday life. Why not also at work? Visuality is a language. It is more, and I'm talking about 5S as well, because 5S is the beginning of the beginning of the beginning of the foundation of the visual workplace. Maybe you'll be interested in our going to that in some detail as the second time that we meet this year. So please let Paul know. 5S on steroids. 
operator-led visuality, very different than 55S. It's more than a brigade of buckets and brooms, labels and lines, or posters and signs. It is a compelling operational imperative, crucial to meeting daily production goals, central to your war on waste, vastly reduced vastly reduced lead times, and an accelerated flow, an accelerated flow that you control at will. It is the details of your operational system, as I was saying before, embedded into the living dynamic landscape of work, the language of the excellent enterprise made visual, even if you're not quite as excellent as you know you will be in another year. It captures your current operational system. That is its purpose. And so a visual workplace is populated not by hundreds of visual devices, but by thousands, and also clusters of devices that are called mini-systems. And they're invented by a workforce that knows how to think visually, a word that I coined, visual thinking. What is visual thinking? It is this. It is your ability and mine to recognize the enemy, and the enemy's name is motion. Moving without working, we'll do more about that in a moment and the information deficits that trigger that motion, the missing information that trigger us into motion, and then we eliminate both through solutions that are visual. That's what a visual thinker does. We are visual beings by birth, most of us, and we need to learn to become visual thinkers, and then we can make a very significant contribution to the betterment of our company and to our own lives, of course. Simply put, there is one reason why a visual workplace is needed, and that is because people have questions. They have too many questions. And the thing about these questions is only some of them are asked. Most of them are not asked. People either might make stuff up or they wait and they do nothing. You know, this is just human nature not to ask questions. It's human nature to ask them, but there are certain questions in certain circumstances where we don't ask them. Hmm? But when we look at them all, I want to kind of get to uh, the nub here without going on much of a detour about why we behave as we do. Only two questions drive a visual workplace. The first question is, what do I need to know? Let me blow that up and kind of unnest it for you. What do I need to know that I don't know right now in order to do my work? I want to pull your attention to a couple of things about this particular question. One is, look at the arrows. The arrows are all pointing in. Visuality is indeed a pull system. We pull information to us when and as we need it. That is the self-explaining part. We answer the question, what do I need to know that I don't know right now in order to do my work? We put a visual device in place and we pull it to us. That becomes a part of our locus of control, of our value field, of our cell, our booth, our desk, our department, and we pull the information to us. I also want you to notice that this does not say, what do we need to know? This says, what do I need to know? Visuality is an I-driven environment. And I included in the three articles that we shared with you, one particular article that appeared in our newsletter, The Visual Thinker, on iDriven, so that you can get to know that better. But it's very, very important. I won't be able to develop the theme fully in our discussion, but I do want to draw your attention to the I. And if you're worried about what about the team, we'll find the team in the second question, but maybe not quite in the way you expect. The second question is, what do I need to share? In need to share, the question is, what do I need to share that I know, that others need to know, that I need to share so that they can do their work better, more safely, more on time? And so I listen to the questions, or I notice the motion. Questions are a form of motion. I notice the motion of others, and I answer the question. I answer it. I notice it. And I put it in place, and they pull that information to them when and as they need it. When and as they need it. Can you hear the we in that? Can you hear the self-leadership? 
can you hear that I as a servant, leader to others, self-managing, but also sharing vital information? Because that is the dynamic of this second question. Hmm? So I have a little t take it home, if you wish, exercise if you want to do this. Hmm? Solo, by yourself or with a team, ask yourself, what do I need to know that I don't know right now in order to do my work? Get an answer to that question. Decide where you want to find that answer the next time you need it. Because the visual workplace is a physical workplace, you always need to determine the location of the answer, of the visual answer, so that it's there as close to the point of use as possible. And then you turn your answer into a visual device and you place it there, you locate it there. When I say do it solo, I mean do that for yourself or ask your team to do it for each themselves. I do not recommend if you want to experiment with this the way it's given that you turn the I into a we, but just individually. You'll have a team of three or four people, seven or eight, probably that's enough for the first time if you're a supervisor and say, hey, listen, why don't you play with this question for the next couple of days and let's get back together. Notice what you need to know that is causing you to walk around, ask questions. We'll unnest this in a moment, I say to you as the audience. See what your need to know is, write it down and Think of a visual device, and they'll be pulling from their imagination, which is not the same as methodology, but it will give you a taste and give them a taste of the information deficits in the workplace, and that's the point. So I hope you try that out. Let's look at this and try to find our visual primer, basics that I've been going through in this kind of environment, we're at the airport, we're at a gate, and I want you to notice the visuality. If we were together in a room, we'd do this interactively, but since uh, I can't hear you and you can only hear me, I will walk through this. Let's look. We've got a lot of visual devices. We have this double bordered area to warn us about the whirling turbines because the plane has just landed at the gate. We have this place here for catering, keep it clear. The catering truck is going to come up and back here for baggage. And there's more. Here we have the critical path. Here's the lean part. Here's the value stream flowing into place, top down. And we also have this nest of visual devices. And that's what I want you to focus on. I want you to ask yourself, how does this work? What does it mean? Why is it there? Why is it there? Why do we have this nest? We have borders, which is what I call the lines that are often referred to in 5S, and we have addresses, which you may call labels, but I call them addresses because both borders and addresses have functionality and lines and labels are very, very generic. So look at those borders and those addresses and ask yourself, what is the motion that this configuration, this visual configuration, this mini system, as it were, addresses? and maybe you're talking to each other, you're there with a group and you're talking to each other, or you're thinking, what could it be? And in a moment you will see, of course, that these are the numbers that designate planes, a certain size of plane, and what is different about them all? Well, we know that their front wheels are all placed differently, either because of their size or simply their design. And so the front wheel lands on this on the right branch of this tree and DC 10 is there and what happens is when the front wheel is there the door lines up exactly with the jetway and in the language of manufacturing we unload the whip so that we can reload it and take off with a new load of whip quickly, safely, efficiently, effectively. Hmm? That's the waste. The waste the waste when that isn't there is the match between the jetway and the door. And you will, in Fort Worth, Texas, be s sitting on a plane and hear the door going, er, 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 hear the, the uh, jetway going, er, 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 trying to find its way to the, the exact door. So this eliminates a micro moment of waste and allows us to continue our process. This is a visually competent work area. Let's look at the before. 
because it's a wasteland. This is our recipe for motion, full of missing answers, full of information deficits, and in fact, in this kind of a gateway, this in this kind of an airport, that plane would never be able to land, and we didn't, ha we don't have a need for the jetway at all. This is the environment that a non-visual workplace can support. It has an economic impact and a large one, and it has a performance impact and a large one. So what is motion? Motion is moving without working. This is one of the classic seven deadly wastes, but when I was looking for a metric for information deficits, motion just jumped right into my mind and I knew that was perfect. And when we look at motion, we see hmm, that a very, very familiar list of wandering and wandering and rummaging and checking and checking again and handling and handling again and even stopping because we don't have information or seeking it by asking, by having to answer, by being interrupted, by even just waiting, waiting for the answer, the information to arrive. Forms of motion. This is what I call our gang of four. Mm -hmm. Missing answers, the opposite of need to know, need to share. I do not know, I do not share. Information deficits are everywhere. Did you know that it takes us eight to ten minutes to recover from an interruption, any interruption, however long, however short? That has very serious implications, certainly for quality, for safety. It isn't, doesn't mean just to get back to work. It means to get back to the level of attention and attentiveness, of focused, targeted attention that we had before the interruptions. And many of us are interrupted continuously, hardly having a moment of targeted attention. Mm -hmm. So I want to invite you to another exercise. Take, home, take it home, too. What is the real impact of interruptions on you? If you want to find out, just take a memo pad and keep track. How many times a day are you interrupted? To make little tick marks, how many times a day? And if you want, you can write down the reasons that you are interrupted. Do that on one side of the memo pad and then flip it over. And on the other side of the memo pad, how many times a day do you interrupt someone else? Because the first one is, how many times a day are you interrupted? Somebody else needs information from you, and the question is, what do you need to share? The second question, when you interrupt someone else, is your need to know. They are all about information deficits. Are you beginning to see how the model works? Every answer that you gave to Paul's question is correct when you describe the visual workplace. But what I'm attempting to do is to put a frame around it so that you understand the implications of those answers, that they come down to an information-starved environment. Information-rich, information-starved. What is the impact of that? Well, we're beginning to identify that in this discussion. It is vast. This is the old way we shared information vital information that creates behavior. That's what's going on in every single company of every sort in the world, in the world of work today. It is a translation of vital information into exact behavior. And the way that we made that translation, translation happen, quite ineffectively in my view, is through training and OJT and written SOPs and online information and meetings and questions and meetings, meetings, meetings. That was the old way of sharing information. In a visual workplace, the devices take the place of all of that. And because we design them, we design our environment to give us the information we need when and as we need it. And others in the company, we say everyone, is designing their environment for that, around that very paradigm, that very profile. We have a workplace that speaks. Mm -hmm. Lean and visual are perfect partners. The focus of lean is the critical path, if you accept my definition. The macrometric is time and its corollary speed. Hmm? Visuality, the other side of the partner, we focus on information. The metric is information deficits and 
the corollary of those deficits, which is motion. They're perfect partners, separate, powerful, equal. I guess you could call it a great marriage, <laughs> if I dare do that. <laughs> a long-lasting one, too. In visuality, we have seen again and again a 15% increase in productivity and often a 30%. So here's your polling question number two. Which phrase best describes your company's current expectation about visuality creating bottom line benefits? Number one, we have a separate set of process KPIs that track motion caused by information deficits. Number two, motion metrics exist for all organizational functions, including site manager, and are tracked daily, rolled up monthly. Number three, we recognize that visual devices are important, but we do not need to justify them by measuring their impact. Number four, we do not track the impact of information deficits on our performance because they're not considered a major waste. Uh, we'll give everyone... Right, we'll give everyone just a second, Gwen. Um, yep, while, while, while you were talking, I actually had a great comment. <clears throat> um, have you ever seen Japanese subway or rail, rail station? Uh, and I, he's got a, a name I'm not sure. I would just horribly pronounce it, I'm sure. Uh, very similar color-coded lines to line up exactly where the door yeah. is going to be. Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. I have indeed, and you can often see that at the airports, um, just our regular airports, I, like I think Atlanta, and uh, I was in one the other day, uh, it might have been Detroit, where the doors are similar to that. They don't quite go that far, you know, to line it up, but yes, indeed, that's exactly right. And what we're doing is we're sharing vital information, and people are seamlessly responding to it, so that that, just getting onto the train, doesn't become the performance outcome. It happens smoothly. That's an excellent example, and it's one of gazillions of examples in the community of how we get our citizens <laughs> to perform uniformly. And, and, and I have much to say about standardization, and I do not want you to think that standardization is an answer that I embrace wholeheartedly in a visual workplace. But in, it's certainly the Japanese are very, very strong on that and very strong in organizing their millions and millions of commuters. Thanks very much for that example. Uh, we have the answer to the polls question. Thank you. 14% separate process KPIs that track motion. Wow, number one. fantastic. 7% motion metrics exist fantastic. for all organizations. 26% wow. no need okay. to justify. And 53% don't track uh -huh. impact of, of information deficits at all. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being honest on that. Um, so thank you. I don't want to make any further comment because I don't want to give it more of a valence than just your sharing information candidly. Thank you. So let's go on in building the case. I mean, we could talk about this in many different directions, but let's follow the um, presentation because I have some points to make. This one is about results. So I have a great friend and uh, one of our licensed affiliates in Australia, Brian Levitin. He's a really terrific guy. He used to be an astrophysicist, believe it or not, and now he's in continuous improvement, honestly. At any rate, he's a follower and a, a licensee of our work. And uh, he worked with a group of engineers in Australia, and he has achieved the greatest improvement using motion as a metric uh, so far. He uh, worked with a group of 18 engineers in Australia and Sydney, and they used interruptions as their motion metric. They said, if we weren't so interrupted so much, we'd be able to get our work done. And they decreased their interruptions through visuality, and their weekly productivity went up by 34% by their own measure. And they were fussy budgets. They you know, were very exacting about exactly what do we mean by increase and what do we mean by productivity. And that was a very, very handsome outcome. And I uh, really delight in sharing that because uh, you know, engineers are wonderful people, but they're a little bit tricky to work with. And the productivity, again, was spectacular. Lockheed Martin, this is an interesting story where uh, we worked with Lockheed for about three years when they were challenging for the Joint Strike uh, Fighter. And there was, we worked mostly in the Fort Worth um, uh, Dallas plant. And there was a big controversy that came up after about a year with the lean group 
and the visual group, they called it 6S Visual because they wanted to hold on to 6S and visual and they like to say 6S success, if you got that, <laughs> success, success. And there was a controversy about who was doing what and who should get the credit because the lean guy said, you know, you're coming in, you're doing all the stuff that we were going to do, but we should get the credit for it because you're just, you know, using 5S in a way that it shouldn't, shouldn't be used. It's, it's, um, it's not meant to uh, uh, move into the lean realm. And the visual guys said, we're not doing anything except visuality, and it just so happens that it's as powerful as lean, which is more powerful. So they did this experiment at their Palmdale, their skunk work plant, but in their fighter jet modification station. And if you know about modification, it's something similar to upgrading, but there's also some overhaul and repair. There's also a kind of MRO environment. And they said, let us do nothing but visual, no lean tools, no lean principles, no lean nothing, only visual and see what happens. That was their commitment and let's do it for a thousand hours of improvement. And you know, these guys uh, at Lockheed, they may be cowboys, but they are serious, scientific, uh, relentless cowboys and that's what they did. They applied a thousand hours of success visual only, and this was their result seven months later, a 15% productivity increase, and they had reduced the labor content by 700 hours per unit per plane with a complete payback in seven planes. This was an experiment that they did that they shared with us, and it's making the point, a point that I want to make quite specifically, that visuality is a partner to lean and it is equal, but it does different things. It will still get powerful results on this level, but it, it's a different kind of result and a different kind of process. And I wanted to just add a bit on the cultural element from work that we did with Trailmobile, which was again an assembly plant, but this time for trailers. And we're going to hear from April Love, her real name. Director of Continuous Improvement. She began simply as the Visual Workplace Coordinator and I asked her to comment uh, after about two years they had taken over the implementation by that time in this beginning very difficult plant. Trailmobile had just acquired it and it had a 46 percent accident rate when it was required. So you know there were a lot of lot of problems, a lot of fear in that plant and after two years she said this. This visual approach has unlocked the potential of our employees. The potential was always there. We just couldn't see it. Now associates are the driving force behind not just change, but our journey to excellence. And new employees can light a candle from an existing flame where before there was nothing. And this has to do with our effort to create visual thinkers, to create a system of thinking for people on the shop floor. It's what Ono said about Toyota. People don't come to Toyota to work. They come to think. I found that quote many years later, but I understood what was meant by that. That when you teach people to think, to fish if you will, to think, it really creates a different kind of environment, powerfully so. Visuality is eye-driven, and so that's one of the results. Now I want to talk in the, our last few moments about the Visual Lean Alliance and just put it together for you so that you can, I can share what my experience has been. And here's our third polling question. Which phrase best describes how your company stabilizes and sustains its lean gains? Number one, we gain stability by standardizing everything. Number two, we sustain through a lot of OJT and in-house skill training. Three, we stabilize and sustain by embedding our standards in our SOPs through visual devices. Four, we have a lot of veteran employees, 25 to 35 years, their skill level is the key to our stability and our sustainment. Five, none of the above, something else. Uh, Gwen, and as everybody's answering the question, I just wanted to uh, let everyone know as we get towards the end here, if you have any questions, feel free to enter them as we go. You just want to, just say it again, Paul. We lost the um, last few words. Just wanted to let everyone know that um, if you have any questions, enter them as we go. I will uh, come back and answer or ask you the questions here in a few minutes. Also, I wanted to uh, let everyone know 
if you do have a specific target of, of content that you feel you would like to know more about based on what Gwen said so far, go ahead and enter, enter it into the question box because we will be able to take that information and use that to uh, arrange the, the webinar next in uh, 2016. So, And do you mind if I say that we have, um, I do a weekly radio show and we have well over 100 hours of podcasts if you want a further kind of instructional primers. That's all I do is talk about visuality. I've tried to make it a call-in show, but I think I talk too much. <laughs> so you can get that from our website. I, I think you'll find that very instructive as well. That's perfect. Thanks, Gwen. Yeah. Um, let's go back to the poll. 13% uh, said, number one, we gain stability by standardizing. 30% sustained mm -hmm. through a lot of OJT. 12% yeah. sustained by embedding standards. 16% mm -hmm. a lot of veteran employees. And 29% none of the above. Okay, okay. Be interested again to know what that 29% is. I, I, My suspicion is I um, have overlooked some category. That's very powerful. Thank you. Um, so let us look at the Visual Lean Alliance. I conceive of the partnership between Visual and Lean the way I think of wings on a bird. They are separate but equal. Lean is about pull and the critical path. Visual is about information and adherence. It's about embedding behavior. Which wing is more important? Well, you know, you can ask a bird and it will fly off because it is always in perfect balance. The balance itself is the perfection between these two wings and a uh, company that has achieved operational excellence. For example, I'm thinking of, about uh, Parker Hannafin and Irvine and also almost, almost World Nautobahn trailers in, um, in Holland and a couple of other companies where there is a real balance between visual and lean. That's the point, that you create this balance. You have to begin somewhere, but you don't forget about one of the wings. If you forget about one, the, bir the bird's not going to go anywhere. It's going to do a lot of flopping, and after a while, it's going to get tired. <laughs> so let's look at an obstructed flow, steeped in waste and rooted in, pu in push. Material comes in, material goes out, finished goods, and this is the pathway. Not anywhere near as complicated as it really is. And those little gray things are where all the leaks are in the juncture points. Mm -hmm. The twists and turns of a thoroughly obstructed flow, most time, most distance, most cost, least quality, least safety. This is the, we, the way we describe the pre-visual, pre-lean environment. And now, we can also describe it through the seven deadly wastes, which you're very familiar with. Mm, a little 5% of value add, which is actually uh, image-wise much bigger than 5%, but we needed you to be able to see it, so we exaggerated a bit. Mm? So we are now going to put critical path lean in place, gravity feed, pull, straighten out the kinks, the detours, in the critical path. This is my conceptualization of lean. This is my definition of lean. And this is the powerful outcome of that. What happens when we anchor this in visuality is we stabilize it, we clarify it, we surface the information that makes it go, but also makes it sustained, stabilized, clear, in place so that it becomes a platform for us to then build our next level of improvement on least time, least distance, least cost, most quality, most safety, an accelerated flow that you control at will. It is that control that is important and at will is of equal importance. This is the visual lean alliance. This is the conversion from pre-visual, pre-lean to the Visual Lean Alliance, the Visual Lean Enterprise. People don't come to Toyota to work, they come to think. Thus spake uh, Taiichi Ono, who was the co-architect with Shigeo Shingo, my sensei, of the Toyota production system. And I think that it is a, a, a good and emblematic uh, doorway to think about what are the outcomes of a thinking workforce. Hmm? So I uh, will stop now 
and um, let me see what the heck, ah yes, that's right, there's my slide. So we'll stay on this one for just a moment, and then I'll move to the other if you want to be in touch with us, that will be the way. So Paul, do you want to take over? I can't believe I've come right down on the dime, just about correctly. That's, that's great, Gwen. I, I just really appreciate you doing this. It's just so good to hear you again and go through all this. I have several questions. Uh, first question is actually about quick response manufacturing. And the question is, is your definition of lean the same as quick response manufacturing? I'm not sure if you're familiar with what that is. Or... Well, quick response sounds as though it's using time as a base. And responsiveness is uh, what Lean is supposed to do. I don't know that. I know quantum. I know time-based. Um, I think it's it must be close. If, mm -hmm. if there's, is there anything else written there that might help us be um, more precise? At, in our at this answer? point, that's it. Just okay. Okay. So uh, I would say I, my guess is yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you can certainly send me an email. And we can discuss it further. <laughs> exactly. And I just wanted to make ahead, sure. Please. I wanted to make sure everyone realized that that's the reason that we have the slide up here. I want to just encourage everyone. Paul, are you still there? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Uh, no, no I, actually, I didn't hear you. Maybe others did. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that uh, everyone realizes that if they have questions for you, they can contact you directly, and we encourage you to do that as part of the reason that we have uh, the speakers like yourself on here. So, um, Another Thank question. You. How do you feel about sound? Uh, that would be things like buzz, music, as a visual mm -hmm. indicator. Yes, uh, I call it a visual signal. Uh, there are these four categories of visuality. Visual indicator just tells us visual signal will grab our attention by changing, and sound is one of those uh, that changes, and by changing it gets our attention as compared to just an enunciator button that would be an uninterrupted sound which becomes part of the noise in the environment. When it, it, when it makes some kind of alternating sound, it will grab our attention, we will get some kind of a message, and our behavior will change, such as a forklift that is backing up or a truck. I think it can work. It is um, uh, a, a bit of a challenge. Uh, in a noisy environment, but it can be used very effectively. It just can't be overused because then the environment isn't quiet enough to feel the contrast when sound is introduced. My favorite example of how sound was used is in a, a Delphi plant in Matamoros. Delphi, um, Deltronico is one of my most favorite plants in the world, and I would consider them on a level with Parker Hannifin and Notobaum as it was about five years ago. Um, and that is... Um, Every department, quality was very important in this plant, and every department had a song. Material Girl, Cheeto Lindo, um, uh, Box Suite, whatever. Every department s chose a song that was its own song. And every time, any time there was a complaint from a customer, they would play your song <laughs> over the loudspeaker for all 3,000 people in the plant. <laughs> so sending a message, of course, and then the behavior goes wild. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for your question. Sure. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, what about visual? Uh, I guess, actually, I think looking for specific examples, this is Steve. Um, what might be a, a visual alternative to an SOP or, or work construction like we're used to, you know, text base? What would be some some specific examples of what that might look like. Well, uh, actually, did I? I think I might have in, uh, let me just see, uh, later on. Sorry, I have to go through all of this. Um, here we go, okay. Yeah, in this, in October the 14th, I, October the 14th, 2015, Horatio, would you make a note that we should uh, post that, send that to Paul as well. But this gives you a very good explanation of what I'm about to say, which is about visual standards. There's about five articles that I ran uh, this fall on standardization and visual standards because it's an important point. You can make them visual, as you see up here. If I can just jump out here, I will Oops, I'll move to that and, and blow it up a bit. Um, you can certainly make them visual. You've got a choice there of making them visual by uh, mapping out the entire procedure, or you can um, just focus on the points that are tricky. So um, in this case over here, 
right here we have the, the entire procedure being mapped out. It'll be page after page combined with photographs. In this photograph here, in this visual standard here, let me try to make it, oh, I know how to make it bigger down here, hold on. We have just the tricky part right here the tricky part of how do you tape a wiring harness. So you can do it one of two, those two ways. And it is really, really, really important for you to document your standards and make them visual. The only thing you need to know is that that two-dimensional format, it's written right here, that flat format is a culprit because we think because we publish the standard that people will follow it. But it is, as I mentioned before when I was talking about sound, sound is a visual signal, slightly powerful. The least powerful is the first level of visual device, which is a visual indicator that tells only. It's only telling us. It's telling us what we're supposed to do and relies on our internal motivation to get it done. We pay attention because we decide to, but it isn't powerful enough to to make sure that we get the change of behavior. For example, the speed limit, children at play sign, is a visual indicator. It tells us, slow down, children at play. But this speed bump translates it into behavior. So we might get the behavior change with this device, but we will get the, the behavior change with this device. So, so this documentation of standards is an early and very important step, but don't be disappointed if you find that it doesn't solve your problem. Because with visuality, what we do is we create visual devices until we get the behavior change. If we get it only partially, then we, need, we know we need a more powerful visual device. And that's the journey of the visual thinker. Many times on the operator level, the operator is looking at him or herself and saying, did I get the behavior change from myself? And if there is a wiggle, and it'll show up in the metrics and the KPIs, there'll be mistakes made. I have to make this more powerful. And of course, others benefit from it. There, there are you know, department-wide devices that people will develop, and then it'll spread as visual best practices to other departments. This was a very good question, and I hope that uh, you understand my response to it. And, and please look at this article. Um, we'll be posting it. Uh, send it to. We'll be sending it to um, Paul as soon as we get done with our session today. It'll be waiting there for you. All by the way, our weekly newsletter is also terrific, <laughs> if I can say so. But you know, I'm trying to share these components of a very beautiful and rich, very robust system that will help you a lot. Please, uh, what else? I hope that was good. Uh, that was great. Um, Sergio had a question. How can, Hi, you, how can you track the improvement in productivity if it has never been tracked before? What would you suggest? Yes, well, um, I did a show a couple of years ago on this. And my advice is, if you've never tracked productivity before, and even if you're factory or your facility is not ready to do it on a management level, just start counting. Just start counting output. And then put output on the background of time. So begin by simply counting. And then, you know, on, on one axis put how many and the other axis put time. And go easy. Don't get too granular about this because it will defeat you. And just get used to. I remember when we, we I remember railing against uh, uh, my visual workplace coordinator at Nautobahn Trailers, Roy Coopers, a um, really great desk engineer. And suddenly he was thrown in the middle of a strategic change. And I needed to work through him because he was in Holland. And we spoke every month. And I remember in November I said, I need you to put a clock up. We're ready for a clock. They were moving towards pull, but they weren't ready anywhere near ready for either standard work or any kind of paced production. And I said, I just want a clock up. It took him four months to break that barrier in his mind. And finally, after very loud words, and um, anyway, you don't. I don't need to recreate that scene for you, but I finally convinced him he needed to put a clock up or his life was in danger because I was going to show up in about two weeks. And he put the clock up. 
and that's just a very good way to begin to get people used to the concept of time and then you can begin to move towards the demanding pull of tact. So it's the same way with metrics. Keeping track of your productivity, you may know from these seminars with ASQ that you really need it in your department, but management isn't ready or you don't want a big a big foot system coming down on you because it's going to be somebody else's idea of uh, how to how to track productivity. So just count. And then, uh, you know, I will try to find that show and in this thing with Paul, we'll send you a link to that and maybe a couple of other things about getting started with metrics. But I'll tell you, it's a great journey. And I also want to say to you that there is a way of using metrics on the departmental level that will actually drive improvement, not just monitor performance, but drive improvement. And you can also do that individually by doing something, and this may ring a bell for you, by stacking the metric, by s segmenting the metric. And when you do, you begin to identify cause. And, and, and let me just say something a little bit grand here. My experience of the Toyota production system and all of the production systems which were more or less mother's milk for me uh, when I was in, in the 1980s when I began this, this profession. The entire production system approach is about causality. The Toyota production system, although it's not discussed uh, separately, is about causality. And your question is a question that will open that door. Uh, and, you know, I want to say I'm happy to have a discussion with you about that and please by all means send an email, make an appointment and we can talk. But I can't put that in writing because I'm a writer. It takes me hours to write the simplest emails if it's complex, if it has a lot of layers. But we can talk about that and we can get you started and uh, direct you to some podcasts. But it's a very worthy question. I'm very moved by your interest and the modesty with which you asked that question. Thank you. We uh, are at the end of the webinar. I have one more question. If anyone has any future questions or any other questions, please send them in now. I understand if you need to leave, you can capture the rest of this on the video later. The uh, question was about the knowledge environment. So I'm assuming we're talking office environment, things like that. Do okay. you have any examples you can share of uh, visual devices in a knowledge environment? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me see if I can find them. Hold on. Uh, if you can hang around for a moment, I'll share some of my favorite. Well, I'll share you, share one that will be easy to get to. Hold on for a second. Um, yeah, here we go. Here we go. Uh, it's here. We have something called the ten doorways, and one of the doorways is um, called um, the Visual Lean Office. Just a moment, please. So these doorways, uh, I'll just throw it on the screen. This right here is doorway number eight, and it is focused on bringing visuality to the office. And now let me go down to the example. This is our public seminar. It's way down here. Here we go. There we go. OK. So this is a really cool visual device. It's an address. It's part of your 5S system. And, 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 and it's an address. Cindy Barter came up with it based on principles that she learned. But it's a very cool address because it's not sitting on her desk. It gives her name. It's airborne. It's double-sided. It's laminated. Her name, her buyer number, extension, responsibilities. And if you are not needing uh, to order something of this nature, then you need to find someone else because she's responsible for this. Here's her, her uh, backup if she's not around. We could add a picture if we wanted to. And here's Jose Montero in the back. So this is a really great, this is easily adapted for office and so much better than something that is just put on the um, top of the desk. This is Dave the Wild Man at Trailmobile. And there is Dave looking very wild. And he's a purchaser, and he has all the parts that he's responsible for purchasing. And this helped him and helped the people who were next to them who had their own signs of that order. Um, 
so that's one visual device. But you know, when you're working in the office, do that uh, first exercise we talked about, which is what do I need to know? And have your office mates do that individually. Give them a little memo pad. Have them keep track of the times that they ask questions because that's their need to know. And then flip it over if you want and have them keep track of the times that they're asked questions, which is their need to share. And you can work in the office some very, very nice visual devices just using that simple methodology. It, I'm sorry, that simple device, that simple tool. This is not methodology. A methodology is a sequence that creates a specific outcome. But this is a very nice tool that will give you a way to begin to make your uh, office visual and use this in the hospitals absolutely. Do you see what I mean? I, I know I'm not I'm not able to speak to that person, but I hope that need to know, need to share rings a bell for you. It is what we talked about this morning uh, earlier on. I'm just going to move up there. I know we're going to say goodbye. So this one, need to know, need to share. To share. All right, here we go. Second question. Work that with your little memo pad. Memo pads are terrific. They have to be pocket sized so that you can just stash them in your belt or in your pocket. I'm done. Thank you. I had a wonderful time. Uh, Gwen, I want to thank you. I want to thank you again for uh, what you've done. Uh, that is all the questions we have. Uh, is there any 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 last comments? Anything you would like to close with, Gwen, before we leave? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for giving me that opportunity. I would like to say that uh, something that you maybe uh, realize a little bit more fully now, that the visual workplace is a real answer to some of the problems that you have been chasing down that Lean is not capable of addressing. We are not talking about continuous improvement or using the imagination of your employees to come up with ideas and devices. We're talking about applying methodology that is based on principles that allow your uh, employees and yourself to continually find and refine ways to share information so that the workplace speaks. What you want to do is embed your intelligence through visual devices into the living landscape of work so the workplace talks to you. And you are in charge of that conversation. It will talk to you in your own voice because those devices come from your own need. Hmm? So that's what I'd like to say. And please uh, listen to our radio show, which uh, you can also find on our website. We have, we've been doing it for five years, it's f and the podcasts are free for uh, streaming. If you send us your email, we will be happy to put you in touch with all of that. It's a great wealth of material, and we really want to share it with you. I am Paul Harbath, the 215 chair of the American Society of Quality Lean Enterprise Division webinar series. I want to thank Gwendolyn for her presentation and thank you for listening to Workplace Visuality, Perfect Partner to Lean. If you have any questions about the content of this webinar, feel free to contact Gwen directly. Next month, our presenter will be Robert Haffey from RBH Consulting. Robert is the industry leader in applying lean concepts to safety. Robert's book, Lean Safety Gemba Walks, is focused directly on workforce engagement and culture change. As Robert says, to narrow or bridge the cultural gap, one has to find common ground on which to begin a new lean implementation dialogue. That common ground is safety. The American Society of Quality Lean Enterprise Division webinar series is the place for you to hear the best of the best in the lean industry and learn more about how to apply lean in your application. The American Society of Quality Lean Enterprise Division is a global network of professionals helping individuals and organizations apply proven and leading edge lean principles and practices to achieve dramatic results for your personal and organizational success. Come lean with us.